But we had uh, such an amazing um, acceptance entrance through Billy Kluver at Bell Telephone Labs. He knew all the artists who were most active and uh, radical at the time. And I think my second week in New York City, uh, when we were staying in a friend's loft, he said, why don't you go see my friend Klaus on East 2nd Street. He's doing something with a lot of people all together uh, in his store, his tiny store. And I said, what is he doing? And Billy said, oh, just go. He'd probably like you to participate. So I went to this tiny little store on East 2nd Street, and suddenly I was in Oldenburg store days. Uh, he never had my name quite right, so I had to get a rubber stamp when there was going to be an audience and correct the flyers get made. But of course, only about 40, 45 people could fit in the tiny store at a time. And the activation of the participants um, really delineated the space insofar as it could be activated. So there was claws and patty and things hung from the ceiling and fell down. And it was an old store, and I was on uh, top of what had been a fireplace on a little shelf walking back and forth in a purple spangled dress and my instruction was to take a knife and to just bang at the plaster. Uh, under me crawling on the floor was Lucas Samaras. He had other instructions. So it was uh, just immediate instant magic. But we had already um, had contact with artists in New York. And Jim had gone to Varez when he came from uh, Arizona, Denver. Jenny was from the far west, and he had a fellowship to Juilliard. He had, had no money at all. He came from uh, what was a divorce mom with other responsibilities she could barely sustain, and two daughters at home. And Jim, you know, we had no money at all, and I was working as a life model and selling cheese and as a dog dryer in a pet shop, and uh, teaching Sunday school on Sundays, and doing standing up role in porn films on Saturdays. So we had all kinds of dispersed, uh, miserable jobs. So he went to Varez to ask if it was possible to study with him. Uh, Edgar was one of Jim's major living influences, and Edgar said, no, he couldn't possibly take on a, uh, an apprentice. He was interested in Jim's work, but he would like to offer me a job uh, if I could go through all his cigar boxes full of clippings and straighten them out, and it would be probably you know, like $1.30 an hour and lunch. So he wanted to help us. And that's why we, we got to spend a great good deal of time with uh, Louise Norton Perez and Edgar, who was called Goofy, who was so sweet. And when I was working there, the clippings were all just really thrown in cigar boxes from Russia, from Germany, from Japan, from major scandals, major acceptances, shared programs with uh, maybe Stravinsky. Oh, just remarkable to be close to that history. Well, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Artists? there on Sullivan Street, and I was fascinated with Louise because she was the most older woman who was elegant and gorgeous, and I wondered, you know, how do you get old? And even if she was 50, it would have seemed old oh, right. and looked so wonderful. Oh, wow, how, how cool is that? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so you knew of the Arensburg, but were they, they had already left for California probably by then? I never met Arensburg, I just, you know, that was, uh, a history note where mm -hmm. they were. I knew that Louise had been married to the publishing Nortons mm -hmm. and that um, she was an esteemed translator and researcher. And she has done, I think, is it the major Baudelaire or the major Rambo is her translation? Um, well, maybe, it, you know, things, it's a long time ago. There were so many parties, and Jim and I were. You know, very privileged, but we were like kids on the edge trying to see how does time structure sustained work and relationship. It was uh, a huge mystery. 
your relatory. And uh, we learned so much watching them and also being so close to Carl Ruggles. We were very close to Ruggles for many, many years and spent a lot of time with him and saw, uh, interestingly, the kind of uh, rage that would overtake an old person at losing their uh, power, their position, and particularly with Ruggles seeing famed beauties become old women and he would be very hostile and angry when they'd come to see him and he would tell the innkeeper, tell the old bitch to go away. <laughs> and um, she would say, oh, Mr. Ruggles, you know, I can't say that. She loves you so much. Well, I can't see her. Tell her I can't see her. Mm. So there was this terrible undertow of what getting old could do, mm. even when you were surviving your own history, which was certainly the case for Ruggles and to some extent Verez and then for Louise. Mm. But they were only in their 50s. I mean, for, for me, that seemed to <laughs> Well, I'm not sure. When I was in my mid-20s, how old were they? I'm not sure. Mm. Another question, was smoke, cigarette smoking and pipe smoking was very, very, very uh, rampant. Everyone was smoking. We all smoked. Everyone smoked. It was the, a kind of basic social communication, and we all drank. Yeah. Uh, maybe not like crazy, but there was always alcohol and cigarettes, yeah. It's such a different thing, but <laughs> the idea, I mean, smoking cigarettes is so unhealthy. <laughs> I'm so grateful I didn't have to smoke like that. Yeah. But because everyone did. Anyway, I just wanted to <laughs> confirm that that's true. Because um, Yes, we all smoked, and Tenny smoked uh, so much. And of course, he died from lung cancer. And there were all those years when I was trying to feed him vitamin C and hide his cigarettes. And there's a very odd, interesting sequence in the performance document of Snows, the anti-Vietnam War work from 1965, where Jim is a central figure, and it's also where we collaborated on the sound, Viet Flakes, and I did the film, Viet Flakes. And there's a shot of uh, Jim being moved by Shigeko Kubota in a physical interchange. And you can see there's a pack of cigarettes in his t-shirt. And then for some mysterious reason, it doesn't look like there's a cut in the film. In the next sequence, there's no cigarette pack there. It's very weird. Did you, um, did you meet Man Ray? Yeah, I met Man Ray uh, when I did uh, Meet Joy in Paris. He was there. And uh, with Juliet? No, maybe. I didn't meet everybody. I, I met him. Uh, I met Ionesco. I did not meet Sartre and de Beauvoir. I wanted to. I was very shy. I wanted to. I didn't. Oh, interesting. Wouldn't yeah. that have been cool to meet Simone? Yeah. Um, but Duchamp was there, and I think there's a quote in um, Chabon, Chabon uh, mm -hmm. the book of interviews that came out not so long ago before the Duchamp died. Caban. Caban. Mm -hmm. And Duchamp is quoted there as saying, he saw something so obscene and sensuously disgusting in Paris. And the date he mentions is Meet Joy, so I was very thrilled and excited about that. <laughs> yeah. But you actually, you actually managed to shock Duchamp. That was a good thing. A little, maybe, yeah. But um, um, it's terribly hot in here. Is what do you think of Duchamp's character? I mean, what is your feeling about Duchamp? How did it come about that you, and, and Gianfranco Baratello and Henry Martin, they wrote about this. Otherwise, I never would have known. They wrote about knowing Duchamp? Oh, about you you were telling the place names of Illinois towns. Oh, who wrote about that? That's in uh, Barotello and Henry Martin's book. Oh, nice. OK, I forget all these things, yeah. I, I have a copy. Um, oh, I have a copy because uh, Bruce McPherson published it, and he lived with me. Oh, seriously? I yeah, I was with oh. Bruce for 10 years before Anthony. Oh. <laughs> so there's that sequence. The yellow sweater and the yellow roses. <laughs> But tell me, um, so now, how is it that you ended up knowing um, Duchamp and telling the story of the Illinois towns? I think Duchamp heard me talk about Illinois when we were going to uh, Bell Telephone Labs to the silent chamber. We were all, I guess, in a 
station wagon with John Cage and Cunningham and Kenny. And uh, I'm not sure you, you might have to look it up somewhere else. How to do something, no, but it was one of the times when he said in his very elegant, thoughtful, charmingly focused way, Saturday, please, uh, uh, if you don't mind, uh, say me again the nom de uh, place du Illinois. And I said, oh yeah, we'll see, that, that'll be fun. And I have my list with me now because the years when he asked me it was closer to the time of living there and I was very taken with the names. So somehow he knew about my existing fascination with them. So, so there we go, something like this. Okay, Marcel, here are some names. Um, Sydney Savoy, Colono Sadoris, Pesistum, Broadlands Longview, Tuscola, Rantoul, Kankakee, Logo, Iroquois, Aurora, Monticello, Crisco, Gordo, Longtown, Bethany, Mattoon, there's Paris, there's Iverdale, there's Arrocus, um, Tuscola, did I miss any? <laughs> so I just sort of unraveled them. He, he was so cute because he looked like a cat purring when I read the names you know, attending to the sound and strangeness of them, and then he would thank me. <laughs> so, so other people got to play chess with him or uh, do other things, but I had my little name place ritual. Maybe that's something I can. Yeah, I was um, very blessed to have a special intimacy with Marcel Duchamp. We didn't play chess, but he knew that James Tenney and I had been at graduate school at the university of Illinois in Champlain, Urbana, and somehow he knew about my fascination with the Illinois place names. And he was also um, very intrigued by their strangeness and variousness. And so when there were times when we'd be together and it was quiet, he would say, Caroline, please, uh, if you don't mind, say me the nom uh, of places to Illinois. And so um, in those days I had them memorized, but now I'll read from my reference sheet and I would say Champagne, Urbana, Sydney, Savoy, Colono, Sadoris, Pestum, Broadlands, Longview, Tuscola, Grand Tools, Kankakee, Logo, Iroquois, Lerroyo, Aurora, Monticello, them especially. Cisco, Cerro Gordo, Longtown, Bethany, Mattoon, Paris, Iberdale, and, and on from there. Um, so this is such an intriguing early uh, Duchamp image with the shattered glass over his own, seeing him through the shattered glass, through the cut glass that's going to be um, thematic in terms of layering and transparency in his work and also in mine um, delay. So this is um, one of the images from my work, Eye Body, 36 Transformative Actions for Camera, 1963. I don't think I had seen that Duchamp image. I think it's uh, an aesthetic correlation, correspondence. Um, seeing juxtaposition, in a way, it's, I, I see it as a, a retroactive aesthetic affiliation. Here's the most troubling image for me. I consider um, Tell me, which, which nude is this? The Pietre It's the Pietre Yeah, Le Chon uh, this is a very problematic image for me because I've always considered it a mutilation, a genital mutilation. I know the history of it, of his uh, uh, affinity and passion 
for the subject of this image, but it does not escape the scene of uh, a pornographic rape kind of detective story, really because the labia are not defined and the clitoris is missing. And the, it looks like the leg is cut off and the arm is gone and the face is gone. So the issue for me and many of us is can this image occupy two contrary uh, psychosexual positions at once? And for me, I say no. And my correlative has been to use uh, an explicit and defined life-life aspect of my own genital imagery so that the denial, the obfuscation, the mystification can be displaced, hopefully displaced. So, you know, um, for my feminist aesthetics, this is a very telling juxtaposition. And of course, my use of the sensual body, the ritualized work, meat joy, which became so well known, so well known after 1964, my uh, eroticizing ritual has to do with positioning the ecstatic, the ecstatic body, and um, a visceral extension of materials expressing desire, energy, interchange, mutuality, and that's going to be a persistent theme which has to do with uh, imprecision, with breaking boundaries. It's a realm of, uh, that relates to collage and shredding and melting in extreme juxtaposition to the precision and exactitude of Marcel's work. So in that sense, there's uh, the, the motivation is hmm. not parallel. We'll change. I think I'm pushing the right thing. Mm -hmm. A sequence of meat joy. It's uh, oh, the ecstatic dissolution of the bodies becoming collaged with the collage of an intensive um, responsive huge pile of newspapers and as spontaneous as the image appears to be, it took hours and hours to rehearse being submerged in the paper, being in continuous contact with each other and keeping the dynamic of the flow through that material to carry the energy um, out from the core of its own central actions. Well, I think the image is going backwards now, but it's okay. Was it? Oh, so this was before the end of the film. Yeah. It's before the, the, the sub sublime merging between the body and the material surrounding and enveloping it. So in this sense, the work is in intense contradistinction to, uh, to the implied psychosexual dynamics of surrealism. It's in contradiction to um, the predictive aspect of the position of the female body, how it's been gendered in the generations preceding my work. Uh, and it's in contradiction to the perfectibility and mechanization of the images of the female body in pop art. Um, do, you, do you want to do it again? You no, it's cool camera that um, it really is a great HD camera that um, has fantastic effect. 
But what was the, what were you saying about Machunas? Well, if we think about the early community of the 60s and the themes of food, with most of us being uh, living on very marginal jobs and not having the chance to go out to eat. Or, so, so the celebratory food, when artists were successful, was a tremendous gift to everybody, and we relished that and we cherished that. Whereas, on the other hand, we think about Majunas and the purity and severity of his food aesthetics, where um, he didn't offer food except within a very strict fluxus context. And it might be, in terms of George's particular aesthetic obsession, only white food for an entire month or only food with uh, a touch of something red in it, but probably not a touch of red. It was very severe, very constrained, whereas Flux's food could become uh, amusing and fun, and it might even involve fruits and ice cream put on one of the women's bodies for everyone, particularly the men, to lick off. Oh, did you, did you know the Ben Patterson piece, the wash your face? Which it was please wash your face, and it had to do with licking, uh, licking off, uh, sprayed on, um, uh, you know, whole cream, whipped cream. It was very popular for many works, particularly. Uh, I think this men did a lot of cream on the body, on the woman's body, and perhaps it was inspired by the Duchamp shaving image, which that lusciousness, as if that would be. Edible. I mm -hmm. just you know, jump to the tactility there, the viscousness. Mm -hmm. Cool. Viscosity. 